This is a special presentation of Milwaukee Public Television. Next Avenue, a community conversation. The topic today, money and financial security. Live from the Oak Creek Community Center in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, here's your host, Mark Segrist. You know, at this stage of our lives, and I'm talking about those of us who are 50 years of age and older, what do we really need to know about our money and financial security? And for that matter, in today's economy, is there really even such a thing as financial security? We're looking forward to an interesting hour of discussion on that very important topic. We'll be joined by a couple of Wisconsin-based financial exports, experts who have devoted their profession to helping folks like us make some smart choices about our future. More about our special guests in just a moment. But first, I'd like to welcome you to our live webcast from the beautiful facilities here at the Oak Creek Community Center. It's a pleasure to be here, and we thank our hosts. This is our fourth in a series of MPTV and Next Avenue Community Conversations. My colleague, Mike Breaver, serves as development manager for Milwaukee Public Television. Mike is excited as we are about the PBS project as well, and he'd like to give us a little additional background about what our outreach effort is all about. Mike? Thank you, Mark. Once again, my name is Mike Breaver, and I'm the development manager for Milwaukee Public Television. On behalf of the station, all of our staff, and our funding partners, the Helen Bader Foundation, I want to welcome you to Next Avenue, community conversation on money and security here at the Oak Creek Community Center, one of southeastern Wisconsin's finest banquet and conference centers. This is the fourth in our series of community conversations throughout southeastern Wisconsin. Typically when folks hear that we're from Milwaukee Public Television, they often tell us about something they like on channels 10 and 36. It might be Antiques Roadshow, it might be Downton Abbey, Around the Corner with John McGivern, Nova, Frontline, or any one of a dozen of other shows. We actually love the input, and we wouldn't be surprised that the comments are usually about TV, since the word TV is in our name. But today's MPTV is more than just a TV station. It has evolved into a non-commercial, educational media resource with multiple platforms. Besides Channel 10 and 36, the MPTV family consists of a variety of multicast stations, including MPTV Create and MPTV World. We have a state of high art definition production facility. We are regularly posting on Facebook and tweeting on Twitter. We publish a monthly magazine. We offer an associate's degree program in television and video production through the Milwaukee Area Technical College. And throughout the year, we coordinate community video screenings, special events, and workshops for teachers, parents, and children. Of course, one of our most popular services is our website, mptv.org which is now 17 years old. While most of the information on it is designed to promote programs on our air or an event we organized in the community, we do occasionally treat mptv.org as its own channel. We've produced several programs in recent years that were available only on mptv.org. This year we launched Next Avenue, an MPTV service that is unique to mptv.org. When you access it by using the line on the mptv.org homepage, you're taken to a world of information intended for those of us age 50 and older. And yes, I am one of those that are 50 plus. Next Avenue specific content areas include health and well-being, money and security, work and purpose, living and learning, and caregiving. There are articles, columns, local information, and links to videos all intended for the largest and most diverse 50 plus population in history as we all plan for and define a new life stage. The national website is coordinated by our colleagues at Twin Cities Public Television in St. Paul and through a generous grant from the Helen Bader Foundation in Milwaukee. MPTV is offering a series of local community conversations that parallel the information on the Next Avenue website, including this event today, which is being streamed live and will be archived. Just as Sesame Street has been a trusted highway for our youngest viewers for decades, our older viewers are now able to find safe passage on a new road of life through Next Avenue. Thank you for being with us today, here in person or online. And next time you're in front of your computer, please join us on this journey by going to mptv.org and clicking on the link which will take you to Next Avenue. Now back to you, Mark. Mike, thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to have you with us this evening. I'm really looking forward to our next uh, hour's worth of conversation about managing our money and our financial security because quite honestly, 
the task can seem overwhelming as we approach and actually begin experiencing the initial years of our retirement. Our special guests regarding the subject tonight have both had a varied experiences when it comes to financial planning, investment, and personal management. We're joined tonight by Matt Rupi, Director of Investment Services, and we're also joined by financial consultant Bill Cashin, both representing the UW Credit Union. Great to have you guys with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having for us. Making the drive in. Uh, first, I'd, I'd love to get to, uh, get to know how, how individually you both got involved in the financial world, it, and, and you were telling me earlier, Matt, that this mm -hmm. is something as a young man you were, had a great deal of curiosity about early on. Yeah, I think uh, just early on fell in love with uh, the, the stock market, uh, kind of all the, the romanticism around it and whatnot, and just really realized it was so much more than that. I uh, was lucky enough to graduate from the UW system with a finance degree, um, got a job at a, a big financial institution, and just fell in love with it. Well, once you, once you hit the ground running mm -hmm. uh, and you started your practice, what did you learn about the financial world that you probably didn't uh, have quite so much of an insight uh, as a layperson before you entered it? That there's a lot to learn. Every day? Um, every day. It never stops. Um, even today. I, I've been licensed for now over 15 years, um, and I often wonder 10 years from now, looking back, how much more I, would have, I will have learned. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's I think that's what I love about this and what I do is it changes and evolves every day and we're continuing to learn and um, again I can get why it's so confusing to the, the person that can't dedicate their life to something like this as well but it's what I love about it. And Bill before you enter the financial field you had a career already uh, underway in, uh, in at UPS sir is that right? That's correct. Yes. Tell I me worked, about that. Okay I worked for UPS for about 25 years 26 years actually. Um, loved it great company. I uh, just decided at 50 that I'd had enough of that and I wanted to do something else and that's when I started looking at the financial field and I just realized through my own personal experience that there was kind of a, a gap out there with people doing real retirement planning. And what opened your eyes when you left industry and entered the financial consulting field? Well, a lot of it was I could relate to what was going on because a lot of the lack of planning that I see today was the same thing that I was kind of doing. I mean, I was going through all the steps that most people do where you have your 401k. I was lucky enough to where I had a pension to plan into it. I mean, on the other savings things you do, uh, but then you kind of put all that together and you really never put together a total plan that makes sense. Mm. You never really, expand on that for me if you would, you never really put together a total plan that makes sense. What do you mean by that specifically? Well, I think a lot of people have a lot of pieces, <laughs> um, but they never met with somebody to sit down and put together a total plan. This is where I am. These are my short-term goals. These are my long-term goals. This is where I want to get to down the road and develop the plan that's going to get them there. Well, well, from your perspective, Matt, as a consultant, what is that initial session with a client like? I mean, what do you need to know from your client in order to help them? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I think it really starts with getting to know the client. Uh, I mean, even just the, the smallest things, you know, you know, who are their kids? Uh, who's important to them? What do they like to do for fun? I mean, all of those sorts of things. I'm a, I'm a believer that the more I know about them, the better I can help them. But then we get into the nuts and bolts. It's we want to look at their assets. What have they done? Where is their savings? How much are they saving? What's their income look like today? Um, what debts are they carrying? Is it set up appropriately? Um, all of those sorts of things. Do they have a pension? Um, is there any medical concerns in their, in their history or in their family? Really what we're doing is we're trying to find out everything we can about them and then get to the what's important about them before we even start to try to recommend everything. Uh, I, I often will say the recommendation I give you is as good as the thought I put into it. So again, rarely do we give a recommendation in that first, many times even the second ap appointment. It's a process of continuing to learn, continuing to gather, find out what's important to them, and then put a recommendation that's really tailored to that specific person. And really when someone steps into your office for an initial session, Bill, he or she's going to benefit from the team approach. You're going to go back with your colleagues, <laughs> among them uh, Matt, and you're going to do a team analysis on what the potential need and what the potential solution is for a family, right? Yeah, absolutely. Usually the first meeting is kind of a get-to-know, <laughs> fact-gathering meeting. Um, and like Matt said, we try to get all the information put together as far as where they're currently at. And then we'll get together and we'll talk over the situations. And we all, have, we all come from different perspectives. Like Matt was saying, you know, he came through finance. I came through business. Um, and everybody comes from a little different place. And I think if we pool everybody's knowledge base, I think we put together a much better plan. But I can see how that can be a very positive thing. And in fact, there are differing opinions that may result from 
collectively, you and your colleagues analyzing a family's needs. Uh, explain that, Matt, if you would. No, absolutely. I think the unique thing about this industry is there typically isn't a black and white. There typically isn't a right or wrong. Um, I'll often tell our member base that there's many roads to the same destination. Um, and we all do come from different perspectives. It's not uncommon for a colleague to come in, share ideas around a plan, someone to add some insight, and I think the plan becomes better because of it. It evolves, it changes, um, again, because there are many roads to the same destination. And I often tell members that's why it's important to have that trust, to be comfortable with whoever your consultant is so you can have those deep conversations and. Um, and you can even sometimes banter back and forth about what is the right solution. So to some degree, that final solution, that final roadmap for a client could be a combination of thought, Bill, huh? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also important to remember the, the plans. So you put together a plan. It's not etched in stone. It's a kind of a dynamic thing. As situations change, there's always changes in life. Um, there's emergencies that come up, and you have to react to those and adjust the plan to what's really happening. Okay, Matt, uh, 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 give it to us straight. Uh, in terms of the 50 plus generation, mm -hmm. how, how well are we, how good of a job are we doing for our, for our own planning purposes? Well, it, it, and I'll tell you, it's a very unique generation. I, I was just telling you about a study that I just recently ran, uh, read from Boston College. It's, it, it says 51% 50, of people today going into retirement aren't as, plan, aren't as prepared as they were 20 years ago. And why not? Pensions are at all time lows. Uh, people haven't saved appropriately. They're going into retirement with more debt than they've ever carried. Um, they're living longer than they ever have. And then healthcare concerns that continue to arise along the way, those are just a combination of things that people need to start planning earlier to be prepared for. Wow, and, and so someone comes to you with that, that challenging of a situation, Bill, what do you do? Well, every situation's obviously different. Um, so it depends on what the situation is, but there's, there's, there's so many different concerns. There's a lot of multi-generational planning now uh, where our generation is caring for older parents. Mm -hmm. They're worried about their own futures. They're worried about their long-term care should they need it. A lot of people in their 50s are still paying for college for their kids. Um, they're helping kids out who weren't able to get a job when they graduated from college. They're having grandkids. So there's just a lot of different moving pieces that go into every plan. So in doing so, when you're talking about multi-generational financial planning, are you in fact consulting the extended family? Is that what it's become today for a financial consult? Usually we just deal with, with the person. But, the, but there are multi-generational factors exactly. entering into it. But so. we discuss everything that's going on in their lives. But one may not be when you're, when you're taking that multi-level approach there could be uh, different solutions, different advice that not be, might not be advantageous to one generation or another. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, it, I guess at the end of the day, it comes back to everybody's situation being a little different. Some plans are very easy to put together. Some plans are very complex. And there's no two plans that are ever exactly the same. Matt, in terms of basic nuts and bolts, mm -hmm. what, do the, what does the 50 plus generation need to know about managing their money on a 30 day cycle, bill paying cycle, while at the mm -hmm. same time saving enough for retirement? What do we need to know? Absolutely. Number one, that it's okay to seek help because not everybody has all the answers. But I think having a basic budget, it's amazing to me how many conversations we have and we start to introduce those sorts of things to people how many people aren't budgeting that really don't know where their money is going. I think starting on that basic level and growing into a, a detailed plan is where everybody needs well, to Well, how do you do that? Because looking at your checkbook may not mm -hmm. give a true picture. Uh, yep. how, do you, how do you actually get that true picture? I think sitting okay. down, starting with that budget, but then starting to prioritize, making sure things are structured, make sure you're not living beyond your means. Um, understanding what's important. And I hate to say probably the toughest part of Bill and my job is sometimes giving people that, that hard, cold reality saying, you know, listen, we want to help you, but here's the problem. You're spending much more than you're bringing in. You're never going to get to that goal um, and having that, that reality check occasionally. So then you have to start cutting back. You have to adjust. Mm -hmm. And, and, and how, do you, how does the client face the reality of that? Where do you start cutting in today's economy? Well, you have to, everything comes down to where you're going to be at the end of the day and how long you have to get there. I mean, somebody who starts at age 30 saving 15% of their salary is totally different than start, somebody starting at age 50 saving 15% of their salary. So if you're starting later, 
you have fewer options. Um, and maybe you need to be flexible. You maybe need to look at working longer, working during retirement, working part-time. Um, there's a lot of different choices out there. Um, but I think that's one of the reasons it's so important to start early is that obviously the earlier you start, the better jump on, the better the jump you get on things. You know what percentages look like, what you should be saving, what you should be spending. Mm. The later, the later you start, the more difficult it becomes. When you look at it, and I know there's no typical situation, mm -hmm. Matt, but when you're looking at what could be a typical family budget right now that you're serving, where do we spend most of our money? Foolishly? I mean, maybe foolishly is an unfair description, yep. but where could we really cut? Entertainment costs, okay. vacation costs, things like that. And I realize those are important things. I mean, people need some balance and, and they need to live a little. But that's typically where I see people don't even know how much they're spending in those areas. When we go and we look at all the expenses that they can't get rid of, you know, their living expense, their heating expense, the, the utilities, all those sorts of things that they need, their health care expenses. And then we start asking ourselves the deeper questions of, well, where is the rest of the paycheck going? and we start to dig in, it's amazing, I think, the reality check some people see when they understand where their money's going. What, um, what are they telling you, Bill? I think, I think he's absolutely right. I think if you go out and all you need to do is drive by some restaurants now, and it's like restaurants are packed every night of the week. Mm -hmm. And I know when I was growing up, that wasn't the case. There weren't nearly as many restaurants and they weren't busy every night of the week. So I think that a lot of people, especially with the younger generation, their priorities have changed a little bit. Um, they live a little bit more for now than planning for the future. And how do you start saving? How do you start doing that while at the same time meeting your obligations? You know, I'll be honest. I think sometimes it's having that cold, hard truth, but sometimes it's just starting to develop a plan, showing them where they're going. Um, I agree with Bill. I think planning is, is the most appropriate way in, in understanding where you're going and starting to show people where they're heading, that, that, that goal you have a 62 in retirement, you're not going to make it. We need to make some adjustments. In reality, at what age does one have to start planning for the future well, today? I, would, I don't think there is an idea. I think it's as soon as you can get on it. I think if you graduate from college at 24, that's a really good time to start. Okay. Uh, and, the earlier, the, like I said earlier, the earlier you start, the more options you have. And to, in today's economy, today's investment world, where is the best place to invest? How do you start? How do you start actually stashing it away? What kind of format do you choose? Yeah, for for mo almost everybody now, unless they're self-employed, has a 401k or a, or a work plan, a 403b available to them. That's probably the easiest, um, less painful way to do it. It comes directly out of your paycheck. You don't see the money. You don't, you know, and you can just set aside a certain percent and go from there. Plus, most companies now have a match, so there's some free money involved there. What is the biggest uh, mistake that my generation is making right now or has made in years past as it pertains to uh, planning for the future? I, I think I see a variety of mistakes, but one of which might be they tend to be too conservative uh, with their dollars um, because maybe they haven't started early enough and it, it really does become a math equation occasionally. It becomes the either you need longer to let your money compound, which can help, or you need to get a little bit better return. And sometimes they become too conservative with their dollars because they see the risk of the market, but they forget about the longevity risk. They forget about the inflation risk. Um, when they might still have what I would call a full market cycle, which is five years or better, we can be, we have a little more flexibility still we maybe need to move some of those dollars so we can strive to get a better return so maybe we can get them to their long-term goal. In reality, and I know this is your expertise, how friendly is the state of Wisconsin pertaining to uh, uh, tax laws uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the way they are applied to our generation? Uh, and if they're not as friendly as they should be, mm -hmm. or the state uh, is, uh, how can we do better in Wisconsin? You know, I, I think it's just being smart, um, and I think you hit it on the head. I think we've all read the articles that Wisconsin, as far as state income tax and property tax and things like that, tends to be the one ones that's is less, a little less friendly than some others like Nevada or Florida or where we see a lot of the retirees going these days. But I think I still think in perspective with the federal burden, it's still a smaller burden. Um, I think just being smart with your dollars. Um, looking at where you get deductions, looking at your cash flow situations in retirement so we can pull out appropriately um, when we need to so we're not creating more income burden than we need to. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think it's a planning issue. It's just looking smartly at you know, where we can get our deductions, how we can flow our income. Um, there are certain benefits you get in retirees. Social Security is taxed a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just 
approaching it in that manner and saying, okay, where are you paying your income taxes and how could we adjust this to, to make sure? Because I hate to say once you get into retirement, a lot of the sources you're going to be taking income from, you really don't have any choice. So Bill, in your opinion, how, how, how much friendlier can the state of Wisconsin be? Um, Maybe boomers today. I, I think there's probably things they, that could be done, but I think that overall, if you look at how states structure their taxes, um, I was just down in Texas, for instance, and I know they have no state income tax, but their property taxes are much higher. So most states have a, a revenue number that they need to hit, and it just kind of becomes a question of where the money's coming from and where it benefits you as an individual. Um, I know there's a lot of people who have pensions in the state of Wisconsin. There are states that don't tax pensions. Mm -hmm. um, so they look at that as being a big advantage, but then if you look at where the taxes in the state are coming from, they're coming from different sources. What is the biggest challenge that my generation is facing right now in trying to save money for retirement? Is it health care? Is it the threat of job loss? Is it divorce? Is it the education of their children? What's, what's the, the, the worst scenario that one faces right now? I would say, I think the last 13 years, the volatility in the stock market has been brutal. And I think a lot of people have given up on it. And I think that that's a big mistake. I think that you can't write that off as an option, especially if you look at where, what you're getting on returns in other, you know, other investments. If you look at what you're getting in CDs right now or, or fixed annuities right now or what bond funds look like going forward. I think that the, the safe options have very low yields right now. And I think that for people who have totally written off stocks as an investment, that's probably a mistake. Okay, your opinion if it pertains to that. If one is looking at the stock market, what is what is a uh, a, a logical choice, a logical mm -hmm. investment, a, not so much a conservative investment, but one that would be regarded as sound? Yeah, you know, and and I'm a true believer that uh, we almost need to part money out, for lack of a better term. So monies we know we're going to need in the next, you know, three to four years or below, we tend to need to be a little bit more conservative. But in retirement, if we've planned appropriately we should have monies that are much deeper and out further than that. Once you start looking at that five years or better, which I consider a market cycle, I think it does open up more options because I'm, I agree with Bill, longevity risk is a huge concern in folks running out of money and not being able to maintain their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. The stock market does offer the potential for better returns. And looking historically, if we look at five year numbers or better, when you have a professional helping you allocate, success rates tend to be much higher. It's when you have shorter time horizons when I worry about people becoming too aggressive. How frightening, how concerned are you about the health care issue right now as a financial consultant? And how is it affecting families right now as they're trying to save? Yeah, I think we were kind of talking about that earlier, and I think it's kind of the elephant in the room. I think that health care costs are rising so rapidly that they've become totally unpredictable. And then if you throw long-term care costs in as part of the health care equation, it's honestly terrifying for a lot of people. And from your perspective, Matt, what concerns you the most about the um, unpredictable nature of health care right now? You know, just, just looking at the facts, over 50% of people at some point now in today's society will have some kind of bout with long-term care issues. It doesn't necessarily mean a nursing home, but it means on some level they'll need some assistance somewhere. And that's striking to me when we look at the costs involved with those sorts of things and that people haven't prepared for those sorts of things. A lot of times people will go into retirement um, with the dollars they need to retire soundly unless they get sick, unless they have that additional burden. And that's the concern that could take a lot of retirement plans down. Um, is there uh, a scenario that comes to mind, uh, something that you ha actually have faced with a family that you were consulting in your offices that one cannot overcome in today's economy? Um, or do we have in the American system, free enterprise system, in our economy, despite all of its flaws, do we always have the potential to get back on our feet, regardless of what kind of challenge we may, we may have just experienced? Is that potential always there, or is there a scenario that can truly trap us and we cannot get out of? Yeah, I, I don't know that I would say it's always there. I think there's a, definitely a safety net in the United States, um, and I think that there's probably a base level that you're going to hit where it won't go any lower than that. Um, there's spousal impoverishment laws to keep, um, in case one person needs care, to keep the spouse from having to basically go into bankruptcy. Um, so there's some protections there. Um, I think you could put together a worst case scenario that would be very difficult to recover from. Mm. But I think that there always is a safety net where people are not going to starve. Matt, how much you're enthused about I mean, mm -hmm. you, you were drawn to this career mm -hmm. because you believed in the concept of, of one's resources actually being a way of being creative as a tool, not Absolutely. a burden, but a tool, regardless of what your income is. But is there a scenario that comes to mind to you 
and, uh, where one cannot overcome it. Yeah, and, and I think Bill is really referring to, you know, there are social programs involved with Medicaid and things like that. They're, they're going to help people. We're not going to put people on the streets. But when you look at their lifestyle and potentially how it can change, um, I helped a lady not that long ago um, that her, her husband had Alzheimer's. And she took care of him as long as she could, but just trying to position her assets so we could maintain as much as we could and with the system, knowing that eventually he was going to have to move to a facility. He was wondering, they were bracing the doors, things like that. Um, her lifestyle has changed, and she'll probably never recover from that. We did the best we could. We were as creative as we could be within the guidelines and the rules. Um, but yeah, there, there are probably scenarios where you, it's going to be a change for you, no matter how we look at it. You often come up with creative concepts to, uh, to help families out of a jam. Uh, what are some of those scenarios that come to mind in your experience? Well, I think that uh, that's one of the strengths of having the team is I think between the team that everybody we have there, we know pretty much what all the options are. So we can look at each situation and say, this is probably the best way to go with this one. Um, and, you know, like Matt was saying, there's going to be some situations that are extremely difficult. You know, barring the, the worst case scenarios, there's usually options that people have and it just becomes a matter of, it's like, kind of like I was saying earlier, where every plan is dynamic, every plan is kind of constantly changing, maybe you move some resources from one, one vehicle to another. Um, to accommodate the changes in people's lives. But, you know, every, every, every situation is different. It just comes down to the best way to handle it. How does someone uh, choose a financial consultant today? Do they go through their bank? How do they find someone who can help them with that roadmap? Uh, where do they begin looking, Matt? You know, I, I'm a believer, it, again, many roads to the, the same destination. It's, it's all about trust. It's about someone you can work with. But I always suggest to all our member bases, number one, talk to your friends and family, number one. Ask who they're working with. Um, I think they'll probably give you some good advice, but go to financial institutions that you trust. It's okay to talk to four, five, six different consultants until you find one that you connect with. Um, and in that point, I would say then start to work with that, that individual. Um, it's always okay to continue to get a second opinion, but I advise people talk to many consultants before they settle on one. Bill, what's your advice? I think that Matt hit it right on the head. I think it's all about trust. You need to find somebody that you trust that's putting your financial well-being in front of their own. Uh, there's a lot of good advisors out there. Um, and like Matt said, shop around a little bit. Go to three, four, five different people. And what find sort of questions should one ask to, to sort of... Uh, get the feeling that, well, this match might be right for me for my situation. Yeah, you can kind of ask them what their background is, ask them what their experience is, but I also think it doesn't hurt to just put the whole plan out there, have them put together a plan, go to somebody else, have them put together a plan and see what makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. if they're explaining it properly, you should understand everything they're doing and, and something should make more sense to you than the other. Mm -hmm. And in terms of documents, research, background material, what should one bring to that initial meeting so that you, you can do a better job of analyzing you know, the reality of their situation. Ab absolutely. Uh, and I'll tell you, most people don't come prepared, and, and that's okay. Um, we've actually even put together a document just so we don't forget, because we're human as well, and you know, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, but depending on their issue, it could, it could vary, but tax returns, retirement plans, uh, debts that they currently hold, really anything and everything that has finance in their life, their wills, um, their trusts, um, even we'll even have deep conversations about living wills and things like that and the resources available to them um, to do that. I mean, we'll go as deep as, you know, what happens to your kids if something happens to you, if there's still minor children involved. Um, th really pretty much anything and everything that could have anything to do with the financial picture, whether that will, trust, life insurance, statements, everything. To what degree, Bill, in your opinion, does the average person, uh, especially 50 plus, need to change their approach, their mindset about their given financial resources, to look at it as an opportunity, not so much I don't have enough or I, I, I'm overwhelmed by this. Um, to what degree do we need to change our approach about being stewards of the res uh, financial resources that we do have to make it work for us? Yeah, I, I think the main thing is to, I think a lot of people don't put together a plan. I think a lot of people do kind of what I was doing earlier is you just kind of go and you have all these pieces and you don't really know how they're going to fit together, what it's going to look like. So I think the main thing is to put together a plan, kind of know where you're going. And I think that takes a lot of the anxiety out of the whole situation is if at least you have a plan, you know where you're at, you know what the expectations are, and then if you have to adjust it down the road, that's fine. But at least you've got a plan in place and you've got an idea and you've got, you know where you're headed. Mm -hmm. how, how do we need to turn our approach to our 
resources around how do we need to, what do we need to do in order to uh, look at it, in your opinion, Matt, as an opportunity, not so much a burden, something that we have to do. And I do think it becomes overwhelming for people. I, I, we talked a little earlier. I think people turn on the TV. You can't get away from it. You, you read the newspaper. It, it's a scary scenario. Um, I think just stepping back um, and analyzing what you have and where you're going, it, it amazes me um, that people will spend more time planning a vacation than potentially looking at their financial future, not even running the numbers to know where they might be. And I think Bill hit it on the head, nobody has a crystal ball, including us. Um, but having that roadmap and then checking on it periodically, and you know that could be every six months, just to say, are we on pace, are we behind pace, where we're at, but at least it gives us a good picture of where we're going. You mentioned anxiety. Is that one of the reasons why people are putting it off and not facing the reality of their financial situation? Yeah, I think that's one of it. I think people a lot of times just don't want to deal with it. But life's, lives have become very busy now. Um, people work a lot of hours. People have kids they're dealing with, and, and life gets busy. And um, I, think it's, I think it's such an important part of life that people just need to make time for it. Mm -hmm. You just would, need to make time to plan your financial future. Would you agree with that, Matt? People are putting it off because they're fearful of the reality of what they might... Absolutely. I think sometimes it's easier just to assume it will happen and just not worry about it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Back to the point that you were raising about uh, taking a multi-generational approach to financial uh, counseling. Um, to what degree then, I mean, if that's in fact what's happening in households right now, it's becoming so complicated because I would imagine uh, for many reasons, among them that... Uh, extended families right now are sharing their dwellings. Um, how honest is, you know, the, the parent have to be with the uh, adult child and, you know, clear down through the next generations? How open do we have to be about our finances right now to members of our extended family? Because, you know, in my parents' generation, y y you really didn't talk about yeah. bills. You really didn't talk about the given financial pot of the family. Uh, how has that changed and how open do we really have to be in reality? Yeah, I think that the older generation, I know exactly what you mean, but I think the older generation, as they continue to age, they realize that they're going to have to open up and have somebody in place to run to run their finances for them. And so I think most of the time, by the, by the time your parents get to that age, you've got a pretty good idea of what's going on there. But then you need to deal with their financial situation, too, where you need to say, okay, this is what they have, this is where they're probably headed. If they need long-term care, where's that going to come from? Um, so that's looking, you know, at, the, at mm -hmm. the parent side of it. And then you start looking at the children's side of it, where, you know, a lot of times kids have chosen to stay in school because they couldn't get a job when they got out with their undergrad degree. Um, so they're maybe looking at moving, <laughs> moving home again. Um, or they're maybe looking for some kind of additional support. And then at the same time, you've got grandkids coming into the picture. Um, so there's, it is, it's become almost four generational planning when you look at things now. You, you know, and to add one thing, I think the one interesting thing, and I think where we help a lot of the, 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 the aging generation is we continue to educate them. We talk about things we've seen happen. And I think just encouraging them to have those open conversations Maybe that means sharing where all your documents are with who's going to be the executor of your will, um, looking long term at where they might move, those sorts of things. I think encouraging them to be open in some of the problems that there could be that might arise by not being. Mm. Um, and I think we can help that process as well. What is that? I mean, th there must be situations when you're consulting couples, family members, where I mean, it can be quite emotional. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially if someone is, I mean, you're doing some hand-holding in addition to, you know, working the calculator. Yeah. What is that like for you as a professional? Well, a lot of it comes in with that older generation because if, if you planned out your finances and now all of a sudden you realize that you're going to have to care for your parents, that's, that's a big expense. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to decide first if that's even financially feasible that you're going to get that done. Um, but yeah, there is. A lot of times it does get emotional. Um, or you have, you have somebody who has a child who needs extended care mm -hmm. and they're figuring out how to pay for that. Um, yeah, things, can get, things can get emotional mm -hmm. sometimes. What, what's it like for you, Matt? Well, you know... Having it, to serve on such a personal level. You know, I think, well, it, it does become sometimes very emotional. It's very rewarding as well. I, I mean, I think that's what drew both of us mm -hmm. to this career. The, the finances are intriguing, but it's a way for us to really help these people. Um, to really get deep, and, and I hate to say when they're getting emotional with us, it probably means we're doing our jobs right, and we're getting to know them, and we're getting a little deeper. Um, looking at simple issues like, you know, special need children and potentially how that might pass and making sure that we're taking care of the things that are important to them um, through a special needs trust or something like that, or um, looking at an aging parent that might have to move in with the kids, and 
how that might transition and those sorts of things. So, What do you um, see down the road, Bill? What do you see coming down the road as uh, future challenges for, for one to, to plan his or her future? What, what's out there that has yet to be addressed and, and may get worse? As yeah, I think, um, I think health care costs are one big one. Health care costs and long-term care costs are, are a big one, and that's really in a state of flux right now as far as what's going to happen with that. I think you're probably going to see taxes increasing as we move forward here. Um, that's going to put additional strains on people. Um, one of the things, another thing that I kind of like about this whole field is that it's very dynamic. Things are always changing. And that's what, my, like Matt said earlier, you put together a plan, but that plan's always a dynamic living thing. It isn't like you put this plan in place and it stays put for 20 years. Um, and as changes come down the road, you just have to, you have to make the adjustments and deal with them. What is the most complex plan that you have put together uh, since you've been consulting through UW? You, um, you know, um, with your, the rest of your team, I, I, I would hate to say there there are many complexities. Whether that be um, making sure we're passing dollars that uh, parents have worked their lifetime to put together and making sure that we get as much to their kids because that's important to them as we can, whether that be even through some distributions while they're alive because of tax codes and some of the benefits we can get maybe because they're at a lower bracket or you know, irrevocable trust. But I'll, I'll be honest, I think one of the most complex, and I think it was because it was my heartstrings were getting pulled, was that poor lady and her, and her husband. And uh, having those conversations with her about him potentially moving to a nursing home, but making sure on top of it, because she loved him very dearly and mm -hmm. she didn't want him to move, but making sure long term she was going to be okay in the best manner that we could, being creative with spousal impoverishment laws and knowing the rules and regulations around it so we could get her assets because nursing homes are expensive and we mm -hmm. knew that the states were going to make her pay her share. Mm -hmm. Um, but positioning her assets so when he did pass, and he eventually did, which was very, very, very sad, she was okay. And having those conversations with her today, very rewarding. Um, What's been your most challenging session with your clients? Um, I had one woman who had a, a child with special needs, um, and she was divorced, and there was a limited amount of money, and, and dealing with that was probably the, the hardest one. So how did you start putting together a recovery plan for her? Um, it wasn't so much a recovery plan. She was going to get um, maintenance for a certain period of time, and then she was not going to get it anymore. And so it was kind of a matter of planning out what assets she had available at different points in time, and then also trying to earmark something for, for the child after she was gone. Yeah. Where are the future financial planners going to be coming from? Or what, what sort of expertise will they have to have? Will they be coming mm -hmm. from business, as your case, Bill? Will they be coming uh, uh, f from what different uh, collective fields? Where do you see the expertise of the future? I'll be honest. Um, so I, I'm lucky enough to run the program at the UW. And I'll tell you, I really see it coming from a lot of areas. And people like Bill are very unique. And I think, honestly, they'll come from all over. And I think it's really what's in their heart. Uh, Bill, I think, is a very unique individual that he has a passion for it. Um, he's what I call a learner. Um, he's always, he's got a book or a journal or um, he's going to some conference to learn something new. I really think it's going to come from every, everywhere. I think it's honestly just that unique individual that's going to take the time to continue to grow their career and continue to learn because I think the good ones, and they're all over, I've met them from all different institutions, are the ones that understand that if they stop learning, they're going to get stale and they're not going to be good. Mm. What do you think, Bill? Where's the future expertise coming from? Yeah, I think I think there's a lot to be said for life experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's important to, honestly, if I was going to go look for a financial advisor right now, I'd want somebody in my age group. And maybe that's just me. I mean, granted, there are younger people who can handle the situation. But I just think there's a lot to be said for life experiences, having lived it, having, you know, I've, the, your worries are my worries, kind of. You know, you, I'm worried about the same things you're worried about. I know about this because I looked into it because it, it's important to me. What advice do you give to a client who is truly overwhelmed by their situation and doesn't know whether to go forward, sideways, whatever? I mean, what advice do you give them when they simply do not have the resources uh, to address their immediate need? Sometimes the first step is the hardest step. Um, we don't have to solve all the world's problems tomorrow. Um, and potentially maybe there are some shortfalls, but we need to start somewhere. 
and that could be with a budget, that could be establishing emergency reserves, that could be starting to set yourself up to have success. It doesn't mean we have to go from zero to 100 tomorrow, but we got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And Bill? Yeah, that's that's exactly the thing. Put together, get together, put together a plan, with, work with an advisor, figure out where you're at, figure out where you're trying to get to, and then put together a map to how you're going to get there. Right. You said that you learn something every day. Mm -hmm. What's the most recent thing that you learned when consulting a family that you had not addressed before? You know, I, I recently, and not that long ago, actually sat with a poor gentleman who had leukemia and they were knowing he was going to pass and we started addressing what that was going to look like for his wife um, and how that was going to transition and what that was going to look like, knowing there'd be some life insurance and things like that. That probably, uh, again, this is why we do this every day, um, but being able to help that, that poor lady out and, and, and set her up appropriately, knowing what was coming down the road. What can consumers uh, do for themselves in terms of their own research, increasing their own knowledge about uh, planning, budgeting, management, saving on their own, in addition to going to consultants such as yourselves? Mm -hmm. What can we do in terms of reading material, yeah. exposure on the web, in there, order to you know stay up to speed? Yeah, there's, um, there's a world of resources out there now. You can go on Google and you can Google anything you want to look up and it will pull up results. Um, the information has never been more readily available faster than it is right now. So if somebody has an interest in something, the resources are out there. They're very easy to get. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I not, to, not to give our, our website, but at the UWCU, uh, our website, we have a tool called Balance. Education is very important to us. There are hundreds of great articles out there that people, if they just want to educate themselves, it's a free resource. They go to uwcu.org. Just look at the Balance tab, and that's all it is, is a free resource to learn about it's simple things like budgeting or investing 101 mm -hmm. and everywhere in between. Would you share that website address with us? Um, uh, www.uwcu.org. Okay, okay. And, and it's a uh, tool called Balance. Okay. Uh, other, other resources that come to mind in terms of uh, business journals, in terms of magazines, oh. whatever, just to uh, stay up to date with what's happening oh, in the marketplace gosh. and the options before us? I, I think, honestly, probably some of the easiest resources for the, the, the normal consumer. You know, Morningstar is a great resource. It's a great free resource. Yahoo Finance is a great resource. Um, they're simple. They're easy. Bloomberg has a great resource, all free. I often will direct my member clients to those resources as great places to get some additional information. Um, that's easy, it's free. Um, they can get some ideas, they get differing points of view. Um, all wonderful resources. Bill, what, what keeps you in the field? What's, what's keeping you involved, engaged? Uh, why just, do you want to come back to work tomorrow? I just really enjoy it. Um, I mean, I've been doing it for eight years now and it never gets old and I don't see it getting old. Um, it's just, I think it's the fact that you come to work and no two days are ever the same, no two clients are ever the same. So mm -hmm. every day is a new day and a, and a, and a new challenge, a new thing to do. Uh, and what about you, Matt? What keeps you going? I, I, I think the relationships. Um, I do, I also love, I learn every day. But I think ultimately it's the relationships that keep you going every day. The knowing you're really making a difference in people's life, you're helping people. Um, I think that's what keeps me going every day. Okay. If you wouldn't be doing this, what would you be doing? <laughs> I'd probably be retired. <laughs> probably be retired, right. Yeah. What about you, Matt? Um, I, I wish I could say that, but <laughs> that's not the case. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'd probably be doing something else where I could help people. I don't know what that would be, the healthcare field or what, but somewhere where I could get involved with people every day. Well, Bill and Matt, we've really enjoyed your expertise. Thank you so much for making the drive in and, and, and for sharing your background, your knowledge. And uh, Obviously, you're both in a very noble profession. You're saving families in Wisconsin, so thank you very much. Uh, we've learned a lot from our conversation. I know the members of our audience who are with us here at the Oak Creek Community Center have some questions for you as well. So we're going to be bringing the microphones into the audience here in just a moment. Uh, all we're going to ask you to do is raise your hand so that we can get the microphones to you. Uh, and, of course, we invite... Uh, members of our uh, website audience to stay with us for that portion of our program as well. First, a couple of housekeeping matters. We urge members
members of our Oak Creek audience to uh, complete our survey and turn it in. Uh, we'd appreciate you doing that because we really uh, benefit from your feedback on our series. In addition, uh, everyone here will be offered a lifelong learning certificate at the conclusion of our program. Okay, so let's get started with some further questions. First of all, you, sir, go right ahead. Yes, uh, once again, this is an excellent conversation. Thank you for doing this. Um, as far as uh, financial advisors, um, does the client pay monthly or does it, uh, the commission comes out of the, the, the plan or how does that work? And then two, uh, at some point, if they don't like the advisor, can they transfer out of it, break out of the contract or maybe you could explain a little bit about that? Absolutely. You want to no, uh, great questions. Um, number one, it's going to vary on the investment type. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of different types of investment. Um, some are determined by the mutual fund family, so uh, that could be an ongoing fee built in, um, that could be an upfront commission, um, those sorts of things. And I do think it's very important that you always have the fee discussion. Um, if the advisor or consultant has not had that with you, the investments typically are portable. On a rare, rare basis, they are not. And what I might say is if a mutual fund family or a, a bank or something like that has a proprietary mutual fund, um, many times they're the only ones that can sell it. That is a rarity. Almost 100% of the time, those investments would be portable and go with you and can go just the way they are. So if you have a falling out with your consultant, you're not married to that consultant. You can move to somebody else that you trust and, and find value in. All right, sir. And you have a question, sir. Yes. Um, in case of that there is a kind of financial loss with the investment that we trusted the uh, person uh, that deal with that what is anything that we can protect ourselves from doing some kind of contract in case we lose money like we lose the whole portfolio or half of it mm -hmm. you're talking about loss of, of a significant yes, share of your portfolio yes, yes. Um, yeah and obviously we, we've seen a lot of that we had 2000 2001 2002 which were three down years market was down 44 percent 2008 market was down over half so a lot of people lost significant assets over those time periods a lot of it just depends on what they did at that time um, if you sold out at the bottom of the market in 2008 and you haven't gotten back in you pretty much locked in those losses if you stayed invested you pretty much recovered from both of those uh, we've had pretty much a full market recovery from to the early 2009 when the market hit its lows so a big part of it depends on what you did then. Obviously, we can't go back and redo that. I think what we need to do is look forward and look at what we think, you know, where you're at now, where you're trying to get to, and what the best way to get there is. I will say, I think, and Matt mentioned this earlier, I think one of the, one of the big mistakes we see is people being too conservative, and a lot of the really safe investments right now aren't yielding very much at all. So you kind of have to weigh in. Pardon me? Did you say too conservative? Yeah. A lot of people are too conservative. A lot of people went through those, those market losses and basically wrote off the stock market, and they become very conservative. And most of the really conservative investments right now are yielding very low returns. So if you lost a significant amount of money in 2008 and 9, you sold out and you're in something very safe right now, it's going to be a long time before you get those losses back, if ever, if you're, if you're going to keep things really safe. And the only thing I would add to that is I think time tends to be the most important factor. There are many studies, and what I mean by that is having that market cycle I talked earlier about, having that five years or better, I think people that are investing a little bit more aggressive in the market and, and hopefully being diversified, one of the biggest mistakes they historically make is they let their emotions drive their, their decisions and they don't give themselves enough time. And what I mean by that is they maybe had a shorter horizon. They should have probably not been in the market. Um, they should have had those assets in more conservatively driven investment vehicles like bonds or certificates of deposit or money market accounts. They should have only had assets in the market kind of driven products that is what we see on TV with these losses that they probably had five years or better. And what I mean, so, so they have that market cycle to let it recoup. You look at 2008 as a great example. Um, very painful to go through for people that were aggressive, but people that stood the course that had a portfolio that was diversified, got through it and got and made their money back typically. So I think developing that planning and having those assets appropriated appropriately is, is the way to go. And you can avoid a lot of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just, I just wanna understand exactly, can you put a clause in a contract between you and an investor 
to protect yourself from a loss that you're going to experience in case of his ma decision making. It's poor. But you put the trust on him. There, there are investments that have guarantees. I cannot write a contract with you guaranteeing an investment against loss, but there are investments that will guarantee against loss. Absolutely. Right. In, in, in our regulators actually restrict us from also making any kind of guarantees. Ma'am, you have a question. Go right ahead. Yes, I want to go back to fees again. Um, I've learned through experience mm -hmm. about fees. It was an annuity fund, which I couldn't touch for a period of time, eight years. And, um, and albeit, this was a company that was written up later as charging exorbitant fees, okay? I, during that whole time, even though I would get some information, I had no idea what the fees were. They were there was no line that said fees, okay? Yep, and even today, I, when I get something back, I, I can't really tell what the fees are. So my question to you is, as a financial planner, can we go to you and you say, this is what you paid this quarter for fees or whatever? I mean, yeah. because quite honestly, I can't figure it out. It's not, it, it's not put in any kind of clear language that I can understand. Yeah, your advisor should be able to explain. If he sold you the product, he should know what all the fees are that are, that are involved in it and should be able to tell you exactly what the fees are. And annuities are a little more complicated. There's, there's different levels of fees, different layers. And, but they, yeah, that should definitely be explainable. And it should be explained. And you should be proactive. Um, consultants should be being proactive in letting you know what the fees are. Um, an annuity or a mutual fund or something like that is a product we call sold by prospectus. And I know they're very confusing, but they're in there. But ask your advisor, ask your consultant. They should be being proactive with you. It is, they are many times very, very hidden, and you don't know what they are. We all know what those fees are. We know where they're built in. We can help you with that. Um, and again, I think that's where finding a consultant that you trust is so important. All right, gentlemen, we thank you uh, so much for, again, sharing your expertise with, with us. And we wish you and your colleagues at uh, UW Credit Union all the best. Continued success thank in you. reaching thank out you. to Wisconsin. Uh, once again, the link to our Next Avenue website can be accessed at www.mptv.org. That's where you'll find helpful articles, videos, and resource information about lifestyle issues of special interest to those of us who are 50 and older. Our next MPTV Community Conversation will focus on health and well-being. We'll be streaming the event live from the Johnson Foundation at uh, Wingspread. We're looking forward to that. That's all happening on Friday, June 28th. A special uh, time for our programming will be begin our live streaming at 3 p.m. in the afternoon on June 28th. Until then, on behalf of all of my colleagues here at Milwaukee Public Television, I'm Mark Segrist, and thank you so much for being with us.